Are you a fan of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert? Then you'll love The Late Show Pod Show with Stephen Colbert. It's The Late Show in podcast form. Listen to The Late Show Pod Show with Stephen Colbert on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. The doorbell rings. Two men at the door. She goes to close the door on them. They force themselves in with guns. They take her by force. They hooded me as soon as I went into the van. A deputy chases them down. I open the rear door of the van and scared me, so I jump back and I shut the door. Follow and listen to the 48 Hours Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, we've got a lot of news to cover with less than a week to go before Election Day. President Biden making a surprise speech tonight, saying the future of democracy depends on your vote. Folks, this ain't your father's Republican Party. This is- President Biden and former President Obama argue the future of America is at stake. CBS's Nancy Cordes reports on why the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband inspired the speech heartbreaking 911 calls. For the first time, we hear one of the desperate calls from a 10-year-old from inside Robb Elementary. Can you tell the police to come to my room? CBS's Omar Franca is in Uvalde with a father who wants justice. The Fed's jumbo hike, raising the interest rate for a sixth time to fight inflation. Plus our report on energy costs skyrocketing as we head into winter, how you can save money and serving up more than a good meal. A cooked tortilla makes all the difference in the world. This is the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell, reporting from the nation's capital. Good evening, and thank you for joining us on this Wednesday night. Tonight, President Biden is calling on all Americans to stand up to protect our democracy amid the threats that election deniers pose to the voting process. The White House says the president is seeking to find common ground with voters that our country's future is more important than our political parties. All this is taking place as the House continues to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol, in which thousands attempted to interfere with the verification of the 2020 president election. And it comes just days after the alleged attempted murder of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband by an attacker who broke into their San Francisco home with the intent to kidnap her. And with just six days until the midterms, a number of Republican candidates suggest they would not accept the results unless they are declared the winner. CBS's Nancy Cordes will start us off tonight from the White House. Good evening, Nancy. Good evening, Nora. White House officials say that the president had been intending to return to this topic for weeks, but that the issue took on added urgency after the attack on Paul Pelosi. Republicans argue it's simply an attempt to change the subject and demonize them in the closing stretch of a rough campaign. Folks. This ain't your father's Republican Party. This is a different breed of cat. In Florida last night, a preview of his message today. They're coming after your right to vote. Echoed by former President Obama in Nevada. They seem to be willing to just make stuff up. With six days to go, the two are taking on the hundreds of major Republican candidates who have expressed doubt about the validity or integrity of the last election. According to a CBS News count, that number includes more than half of the GOP candidates for governor, U.S. Senate, and the U.S. House of Representatives. Come on out, Steve Bannon! One of the most prominent is Arizona's gubernatorial candidate, Carrie Lake. Turn around, because they always tell me in the media that nobody wants it. The elections were the most fair and honest. Everything was fine. Don't have, How dare you question it? Let them know. Do you want fair and honest elections? Let them know. This is very different than what we've seen in the past. CBS News election law contributor David Becker says all the high profile and baseless skepticism is emboldening outside groups, like the one in Mesa, Arizona, that was just barred from coming within 75 feet of a ballot drop box after some of its armed members were accused of intimidating voters. Certainly with the election officials I talked to, The threats they've received, the abuse and harassment they've received, that has not receded. That has been steady and in some ways has ramped up a little bit. I expect to win. In Ohio last night, Senate candidate J.D. Vance said he'll accept the results of his own race, but stands by his criticisms of 2020. I just want our elections to be as good as they possibly can be. Ohio is a great model, but I think other states could do a lot better. 
Two years after the 2020 election, there is still no evidence of systematic voting problems. And tonight, according to his prepared remarks, President Biden is going to argue that conspiracy theories and election lies could once again spark chaos the way they did on January 6th. Nora? Quite a warning, Nancy Cordes. Thank you. We're getting new information tonight on the planned attack at House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's San Francisco home. The brutal assault on Pelosi's 82-year-old husband, Paul, has sent shockwaves across the political world as threats against elected officials have skyrocketed. CBS's Jonathan Vigliotti has the latest. We're now learning that the break-in at Nancy Pelosi's home was captured by security cameras set up outside the house. Sources tell CBS News they're part of a network of roughly 1,800 cameras that the U.S. Capitol Police can access at any time. Meanwhile, details about what happened inside are coming into sharper focus. According to this criminal complaint, alleged assailant David DePap allowed Paul Pelosi to use the bathroom where he grabbed his phone, called 911 and put it on speaker. DePath got agitated. Pelosi tells the 911 operator that the man told him to put the phone down and just do what he says. The dispatcher then asked for DePap's name and he responded, my name is David. He doesn't know who the male is, but he advised that his name is David. A terrifying series of events continued to unfold. DePap trying to restrain Pelosi. Pelosi trying to grab the hammer. When police arrived, Pelosi could not maintain his grip. DePap took the hammer, lunged at Pelosi, striking him in the head at full force, knocking Mr. Pelosi unconscious for about three minutes, waking up in a pool of his own blood. DePap later told officers it was a suicide mission. DePap allegedly named other targets, including several prominent state and federal politicians and their relatives. I anticipate a lot more violence so long as conspiracy theories about our election, about our democracy, are able to thrive uh, unopposed in our online spaces. And today, the Pelosi family is scheduled to view police body camera footage of the attack. Security cameras around the home were not being monitored at the time because Nancy Pelosi was in Washington. Meanwhile, U.S. Capitol Police have begun reviewing their own security protocol following this attack, Nora. Jonathan Bigliotti with that new information. Thank you. Tonight, for the first time, we are hearing the desperate 911 calls for help from students and teachers inside Robb Elementary School during that shooting massacre in May. We must warn you, these phone calls are difficult to listen to and they are simply heartbreaking, but they do provide important context about police inaction. CBS's Omar Villafranca is outside a memorial in Uvalde, Texas, where families are seeking answers and justice. In 911 calls obtained by the Texas Tribune and ProPublica and released with the permission of families involved, frantic students and teachers describe the horror as it happened at Robb Elementary. He's inside the school shooting at the kids! As the gunman fires off dozens of rounds and more than an hour since the massacre started, there's somebody banging at my school. More desperate calls are made from inside the school including one from 10-year-old Chloe Torres, begging for help from officers standing on the other side of the wall. She survived the attack. Can you tell the police to come to my room? I already told them to go to the room. We're trying to get someone to you. Even with hundreds of officers from nearly two dozen agencies on scene, the lack of coordinated communication is clear. At one point, a dispatcher incorrectly states that the school's police chief, Pete Arredondo, call sign 401, is in the room with the shooter. Just be advised, 401 is in the room with the shooter. 401 is in the room with the shooter. Department. Last week, the top state trooper defended his agency. But I can tell you this right now, DPS is an institution, okay, right now, is did not fail the community, plain and simple. Jackie Casares was killed in the massacre. Her father, Javier, still wants justice. What needs to happen in your mind? My mind, you know, yes, I mean, should he resign? Yes, but I, I believe he should finish the investigation. You know, he can't get off that easy. We talked to victims' families, and they told us it is still hard to hear the desperation in those 911 calls. 
Also today, the state senator from Uvalde announced that he'll sponsor a bill pushing for the creation of a $300 million Uvalde Victims Fund. Nora? Very difficult to hear. Omar Villafranca, thank you so much. Well, in Florida, 24-year-old Nicholas Cruz sat stone-faced as he was formally sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the killing of 14 students and three staff members at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in 2018. The sentencing followed the second day of emotional victim impact statements as families, friends, and survivors got their final chance to confront the gunman. With inflation still near a 40-year high, the Federal Reserve again took drastic action today to cool down the economy, raising its benchmark interest rate another three-quarters of a percentage point. It's now at the highest level in 15 years. That's going to drive up interest rates on your credit cards and mortgage loans. CBS's Robert Costa is in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, where inflation could have a major impact on the midterms. Washington's struggle to tame inflation has put Democrats on the defensive and their control of the Senate in jeopardy. Inflation is still hurting people, but we're making real progress. We're reasserting ourselves as a nation. The president's optimism is not felt by the retired union workers we spoke to over lunch near Levittown. Inflation? I rode my bike here. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't afford the gas. Dave Moore and his friends all worked at the town steel plant that once employed thousands. The current state of the economy has them wanting change in next week's midterms. You got to put some new blood in there. Get rid of them old timers. That sentiment is what Republican Mehmet Oz is counting on to carry him to Washington. Are you happy with where America's headed? If your friends say yes, take their car keys away. They shouldn't be driving. Oz and his allies have spent over $90 million on political ads, pummeling Fetterman on rising inflation. Gas prices, food prices, retirement savings. Fetterman has pushed back. I've spent my career fighting for people. But Democrats know the economic headwinds are significant. I think uh, inflation is, is very real. It's a tax of working families. And it's, it's things that we absolutely have to push back again. Some voters unhappy paying more for almost everything also took aim at corporate America, which has seen profits soar at the same time. What do I make of it? Greed. The oil companies are they're high profits. They're making the money. Later tonight, First Lady Jill Biden will attend Game 4 of the World Series in nearby Philadelphia, but that's not the only effort to win over Phillies fans in Pennsylvania. On Saturday, President Biden will be in Philadelphia alongside former President Barack Obama. Nora. Robert Costa, thank you so much. And we'll have full coverage of the 2022 midterm elections. That's next Tuesday, starting at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We hope you'll join us here at CBS News. With home heating costs going through the roof, the Biden administration today said it has set aside $13.5 billion to help low-income households cover their heating bills. Households that spent more than $1,200 on heating oil two winters ago are expected to spend more than $2,300 this winter. That's nearly doubling their cost. So in tonight's Money Watch, CBS's Meg Oliver has more on this and important tips to help you save money. This room during the winter you really couldn't sit in because it was so drafty. Drew Todd used to pay about $2 for a gallon of oil to heat his home in Norwalk, Connecticut. Due to inflation, the cost to fill his 100-gallon tank has more than doubled. Honestly, I think it's going to hit 7 bucks, in my opinion. And can you afford that? Not really. No, I don't, I, I don't know what the heck we're going to do. If, uh, if it gets really cold this winter, what's your plan? Extra sweatshirts, extra blankets. After losing his job in March, Todd applied for a state grant to help pay his energy bill. We're going to keep it up as best as possible and do little with less. Nationwide, families can expect to pay nearly 18% more to heat their homes this winter. Compared to last year, heating oil is up 25% and natural gas up 31%, costing homeowners hundreds more. Why are we seeing an increase in home heating costs? It's supply and demand. Um, first and foremost, you have a global market for energy, for oil, natural gas, and then those costs have gone up because there's shortages. Lorenzo Wyatt owns Home Comfort Practice, which teaches people how to reduce their energy costs. How can you insulate your home? 
what you want to do is you want to keep the heat inside. So insulate the ceiling because heat rises. Insulate your walls. Fill those wall cavities with insulation. Wyatt also advises keeping the thermostat at 68 degrees, closing the fireplace damper, removing or covering window air conditioners, and keeping your drapes closed. Windows are all closed, sealed for the winter. Todd is hoping small adjustments will keep his family warm and his wallet fuller this winter. Meg Oliver, CBS News, Norwalk, Connecticut. Turning now to a controversy in the world of sports, the NBA is under fire tonight for its lack of action in response to an anti-Semitic tweet from one of its biggest stars, Kyrie Irving. Here's CBS's Michael George. Brooklyn Nets star Kyrie Irving is facing pressure on and off the court. Fans at Monday's game wore shirts reading, fight anti-Semitism. Now, NBA legends Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley are slamming Irving and the NBA's response. Uh, we got to answer for what this idiot has done. Uh, you know, I'm, I stand for equality of all people. I think the NBA dropped the ball. In what way? Uh, I think he should have been suspended. Kyrie! Oh. Last week, the seven-time All-Star tweeted to his 4.6 million followers a link to a film filled with conspiracy theories about Jewish people, including false claims Jews dominated the slave trade. In a fiery press conference Saturday, he defended his actions. I'm not going to stand down on anything that I believe in. I'm only going to get stronger because I'm not alone. I have a whole army around me. To the rim with a left hand. So far, Irving hasn't faced any disciplinary action. Last year, Miami Heat Reserve Center Myers Leonard was fined $50,000 and suspended for an anti-Semitic slur. All this propaganda absolutely does have real-life impact. If you look Alan at Mandel is a board member of the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. He says comments like Irving's and similar ones from rapper Kanye West are adding fuel to the fire of hate. Crimes targeting Jewish people are up 47% this year. It absolutely hurts people, and the hurt is going to continue. And Irving has since deleted that tweet. The Nets and the NBA say they're in contact with the Anti-Defamation League for advice on the best course of action. Nora? Michael George, thank you. North Korea lashes out, firing off nearly two dozen missiles in one day. That story plus new accusations against the North when we return. Hey, podcast fans, Stephen Colbert here to tell you all about The Late Show Pod Show with Stephen Colbert. The Late Show Pod Show is a podcast featuring everything you love about the number one show in late night. It's got the jokes, the goofs, the monologue, the sizzling celebrity interviews, plus moments never before seen on TV, all wrapped up in a podcast that drops new episodes seven days a week. Best of all, since it's a podcast, you can close your eyes and pretend you're right on stage with me. Oh. Listen to that applause. They're clapping for you. Or imagine you're sitting next to my celebrity guest. Wow, looks like you two are really hitting it off. The tabloids are going to have a field day. Listen to The Late Show Pod Show with Stephen Colbert on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This is The Takeout with Major Garrett. This week, to mark our 300th episode, he held the line at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, Michael Fanone. Yeah, I remember screaming out that I have kids. I thought maybe I could appeal to somebody's humanity. That's what you screamed, I have kids. Yeah, I have kids. And it worked. There were some individuals in the crowd that assisted me. For more from this week's conversation, follow The Takeout with Major Garrett on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Biden administration is condemning North Korea's latest barrage of nearly two dozen missiles, including at least one that landed near South Korea's territorial waters. Today, the flurry of missiles called reckless by the U.S. set off air raid sirens and forced people into underground shelters. And in another development, the U.S. today accused North Korea of funneling artillery shells to Russia for its war in Ukraine through countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Tonight's Powerball drawing could make someone an instant billionaire. That story next.
Tonight's Powerball jackpot estimated at $1.2 billion is the second largest in the game's 30-year history and the fourth largest lottery prize in U.S. history. The cash option payout is nearly $597 million before taxes. Now, if no one hits the jackpot tonight, by Saturday, it's expected to approach the record $1.5 billion prize won by three people in 2016. And we'll be right back with a restaurant that's serving a community in more ways than one. What happened to her, Mario? How could she simply disappear after she was with you? I don't have answers for that. 48 Hours at CBS News present... I'm just going to ask you straight out. Did you kill Christy Wilson? No. I had nothing to do with her disappearance. Another season of My Life of Crime with Aaron Moriarty. Award-winning correspondent Aaron Moriarty brings you face-to-face -face with killers. Uh, I, I will never say that I'm a cold-blooded killer. I will never say I'm a murderer. And the people they took from. My son died running, running for his life. This season, follow the evidence with Aaron beyond the speculation, including in the death of boxing legend Arturo Gotti. My gut says I don't think he would take his life. I know my husband killed himself. Listen to My Life of Crime from 48 Hours, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Mo Rocca, and it's been a while. But I've been busy digging up even more stories about the people and things of the past that are fascinating me now. What did your father think of the label of the whole idea of the Latin lover? from the screen idols who redefined Hollywood's leading man. I think it was a love-hate relationship. My dad hated the word macho. That's what I call the Latin lover type of a role, which is one-dimensional. To the dog who introduced millions of kids to classic literature. I remember like on my 10th birthday, I think it was, we were gonna go mini golfing and I insisted, but we had to stay home for Wishbone first. Listen to Mobituaries wherever you get your podcasts. Finally tonight, in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, a restaurant in Fort Myers, Florida, is serving up much more than a good meal. They're dishing out some much-needed generosity. Here's CBS's Manuel Bohorkas. Where are we at on potatoes? Every morning, Doug Miller and his staff get cooking. A cooked tortilla makes all the difference in the world. The restaurant is called FK Your Diet. But before you get the wrong idea, the FK stands for foster kids, whom Miller supports. I was a foster kid growing up. But his mission has greatly expanded due to Hurricane Ian and the thousands left with very little. They don't have the ability to just go out and buy a new stove or a new refrigerator. A lot of them, the place they worked got damaged, so they're not getting a paycheck. All right. So the food here is free. And for those who can't get here, Miller delivers. Okay. You doing okay? I'm doing okay, thank you. 125,000 meals so far. His girlfriend, Amy Eldridge, distributes donated supplies. We can't personally fix what they've lost, but we can bring some comfort to their day. So that's our hope. Comfort that Aranda Cruz Garcia says keeps her going. Even though when you're at your saddest moments, he's here for you. All right, love you. How many you got, Dad? A former foster kid now fostering an entire community. How many? Manuel Bohorquez, CBS News, Fort Myers. Thank you, Doug Miller. That's tonight's CBS Evening News. I'm Nora O'Donnell. Good night. Now streaming. I used to believe in progress. But no matter what we do, we just end up back at the start. <laughs> We're in crazy time. The Paramount Plus original series, The Good Fight, returns for its final season. The point isn't the end. The point is winning. Yes! There are bad people in the world. The best way to protect the good people is to convict the bad. So here's to us. <laughs> the Good Fight, the final season, now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus.